Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Adam Deep Dive session. Sorry we're a little late in starting today. I just had a few technical issues. Um, today's session is called Unlocking the Mysteries of the Brain with Digital Health. And I'm joined by four expert speakers to talk on a range of topics about uh, this issue today. My name's Professor Chris Bain, Professor of Digital Health at Monash and lead for our Alliance for Digital Health which operates right across the university and including to our global uh, campuses. Um, just bear with me as we do a little bit of an introduction for you and then I shall hand over to our first speaker in a few minutes. Um, so I'd like to um, respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the lands on which I'm sitting today, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, I'm just going to briefly talk a little bit about um, Monash University for those who aren't aware. Uh, Monash is based in Victoria, Australia. We will have uh, people attending today from many parts of Australia and also overseas. Um, our main campus is in Clayton in the southeast of Melbourne, but we have a number of campuses across our city and across our state. We have a Malaysian campus that's been in existence for about 20 years, um, and there is also part of our faculty of IT there. We have a new Indonesian campus that's been operating for just on two years, I think. We have a facility in Prato in Italy. We have a partnership with Warwick University in the UK. And from the uh, Faculty of IT's perspective at Monash, we are the only Faculty of IT in Australia. Uh, there are many other uh, schools and departments of IT, but no other faculties as far as we're aware. But we have also a partnership with Harbin University in the north of China, uh, also with uh, Southeast University in Nanjing, or also called Soju. And we have a partnership with the Indian Institute of Technology in Mumbai. The, the university has that, but we specifically work with them uh, around issues of IT and more recently with the Koita Centre for Digital Health uh, based at the IRTB. So we have as a, a main sort of collaboration vehicle across the university, this construct called ADAM, which stands for the Alliance for Digital Health at Monash. Um, and ADAM is the entity that runs these uh, monthly sessions. Uh, you can see just a little snapshot there of some of our uh, partners. Partners of Adam start with a group or a department or a school or a lab, and then individual members of those uh, entities sign up to the Adam uh, Alliance and receive the, the uh, benefits of membership. That's not all our partners there, but just gives you a sense of uh, some of who they are. And we have um, in our current strategic view about nine different areas that we're particularly interested in. You'll note that not every clinical area is there, and that's deliberate. Uh, these areas were chosen for particular uh, relevance or strategic importance, particularly because uh, there are other parts of our university that um, have strengths in this area. So, for instance, cardiovascular health and well-being is a universal concern, but it's also um, been chosen because we now have Australia's only heart hospital on campus at Monash University, and so. Uh, they are particularly interested in the future of cardiac care. Today's topic is centred around the focus area of neurosciences and mental wellbeing, however, and we um, do work in digital health or with a digital health flavour from um, basic science and complex medicine right up to um, supporting the provision of care for mental health. And you'll get a sense of, of some of that range today from uh, across our Adam partners. So today's speakers, uh, just bear with me as I rearrange my screen a little bit. So um, our first speaker is Professor Ming Law from the Department, uh, uh, sorry, Department of Neurosciences and Central Clinical School. Ming is also head of the uh, Department of Radiology at Alfred Health. And Ming's research aims to determine imaging genomic and other biomarkers in the early diagnosis of neurogenitive diseases he applies artificial intelligence for diagnoses and for the testing of new therapeutic agents in clinical trials. He uses state-of-the-art and ultra-high field MRI, PET, CT, magnetic particle imaging and photon microscopy approaches towards imaging pathology. Uh, Meng also performs preclinical and clinical trials on novel therapeutics in neurogenerative, neurodegenerative diseases and non-neurologic diseases. 
Our second speaker will be Dr. Anton Isaacs. Anton is a senior lecturer in the Monash School of Rural Health based in Gippsland in the east of Victoria. And Anton's research works on the design, implementation and evaluation of mental health and wellbeing services. So in his PhD, which he completed at Monash, uh, Anton uh, focused uh, on mental health and service for, services for Indigenous men. He co-designed a model for early detection of mental health problems called the Kuri Men's Health Day and also the, supported the development of Jakora, an Indigenous model of early identification and support of persons with psychological distress and suicidal ideation in rural communities. Uh, Anton's current projects aim to improve care for people with mental illness with a particular focus on personal recovery. Um, our third speaker will be now Associate Professor Levin Corman. Levin is officially an Associate Professor as of Saturday. I thought we might take a liberty and bestow the title on him well earned in advance of Saturday. So Levin is a data scientist, computational neuroscientist and a neural engineer. His research areas include data science, machine learning, signal processing, control theory, and computational neuroscience applications to digital health, neuro, neural en engineering, and neuroimaging. And last but not least, our final speaker is from one of our external Adam partners at Outcome Health, and that's the Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Shainal Nathu. Uh, Shainal is a clinical lead in projects enhancing healthcare with the aid of technology, AI, analytics, and robotics. He is a quali qualified medical doctor with over 10 years clinical experience in South Africa and Australia. And he has worked extensively in hospitals, community settings, as well as in mental health and emergency medicine. And he has also served as an adjunct lecturer for Monash University um, and is a published researcher in mental health. So as you can see, a real um, diverse range of speakers today will be talking on a diverse range of topics uh, under the banner of unlocking the secrets of the brain um, with digital health. So I'm just going to leave this slide here for a minute. If you want to take my email address down, um, it will be much easier for me to field any follow-up questions uh, that you may have after today's session via this email rather than me providing email addresses of all our speakers. But you will have ample opportunity to... Um, to ask questions in the Q&A function on the uh, webinar today. And we can address those as we go, but we will also have a good section of time at the end to more specifically address questions and have some broader discussion about the things that are covered today. So with that, I shall um, unshare my screen and I'll hand over to our first speaker, who's Professor Meng Law. Meng, you can uh, share your slides. Great. Thank you, Chris. Can everybody hear me? Yes, yes. Excellent. I'll just go to full screen um, so you can get um, the slideshow. Let me know if it's a problem sometimes. It can be technical um, issues with the full screen. Um, and then just text me, Chris, if um, there are issues with any of the AV. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak um, on probably one of my favorite topics uh, nowadays. Um, Thanks. Oh. All right. Sorry, just to say, we're seeing the um, preview mode as well as the slides or the speaker mode as well as the slides. Okay. Yes. Not the end of the world, but if you can fix it, that would be great. It, uh, I'll just um, play the first um, video, see if, see, if, see if this will work. Okay, there's a little uh, video that will play that I think I'll highlight um, where uh, AI and, and neuroscience uh, will be hitting. This is a uh, little clip from Star Trek. Who are you? Why aren't you masked? Who are these people? I don't know. What the hell is that? What are you doing? Towering of the middle men in artery. What's your degree in? Dentistry? How do you explain slow and pulse, low respiratory rate and coma? Fundoscopic examination. Fundoscopic examination is unrevealing in these cases. A simple evacuation of the expanding epidural hematoma will relieve the pressure. My God, man. Drilling holes in his head's not the answer. The artery must be repaired. Now put away your butcher knives and let me save this patient before it's too late. I'm going to have you removed. Ask. 
Doctor, such unprofessional behavior. Into that little room, please. What is that? You have a gun? Nurses? Please, please, let us leave this. No idea. You got the lock. Dealing with medievalism here. <laughs> Therapy, endoscopic examinations. Wake up. Oh. Around you. After talk to me. Name, rank. Check off. Pavel. Bank. Admiral. Great, you got the doctor thought to call the operator. That's a patient, doctor. He's going to make it. He, he came in with a sheet. One little mistake. So um, I like showing that view because I think it, um, even though it's from the 70s or 80s, so 30, 40, 50 years ago now, it kind of highlights um, even back then what people were thinking about with regard to digital health and AI and mental health and um, neurological diseases. So that device that you saw from one of the original Star Trek movies is probably an AI powered handheld MRI focused um, laser therapy uh, scanner that um, we don't even have yet uh, 50 years later. But I think um, in the next 10, 20 years, uh, we'll see one of these machines um, being used um, to treat patients. Um, so you can see that there's virtually no human inter interaction. Um, the machine will scan the patient, figure out what the diagnosis is. And there's this concept of theranostics where they can also treat the patient. Today, I, I thought I would talk a little bit about um, where we're at uh, currently with uh, data science uh, and um, uh, mental health and digital health. Uh, and then talk a little bit, because I'm a radiologist, talk a little bit about um, Theranostics and where it's gonna head to. Uh, what we're already currently doing with some synthesizing um, images for diagnosis. And, and really, I think the, um, uh, in some ways we're already doing this, we're making diagnosis without actually having to make the images. Um, uh, and you can see that uh, from, the, uh, from the Star Trek movie. Um, if you fast forward maybe uh, 50 years from now, uh, what uh, what will it look like in terms of AI-powered medical diagnosis and therapeutics? Um, many of you have probably seen this um, uh, movie, Elysium, um, 10 years ago. Now it's one of my favorite movies where uh, Earth has been pillaged by uh, war and uh, famine and poverty and so on. But this is um, a space station or a planet, I guess, outside the Earth's atmosphere where everything's powered by AI. So... Uh, I'll show, <laughs> this, this whole talk is not just me showing the movie, my favorite movie clips, um, but it may seem like it, but uh, I just want to show you this one because I think this is what it's going to look like in um, I don't know, maybe 50, 100 years time. <clears throat> this is a little screen capture of uh, a scene from this movie and um, it really shows that uh, uh, I think in the not so distant future, um, we will all be scanned um, by, uh, by this machine um, and then uh, uh, and then it'll be treated uh, in the next scan um, by uh, by AI. So let me just oh, um... I was kind of fast forwarding through sections of the day because it's been caught up, but uh, you get the picture of what um, uh, is happening. Um, this is an extremely hot topic and um, uh, probably the next two or three weeks, I'm giving some kind of discussion on chat GPT um, and various forums. And so um, we're actually having a discussion in a lab meeting uh, next week about 
how it can be used to um, enhance our research um, and how it can be used ethically. But um, I think in a very short time in the last six months, um, ChatGPT has um, uh, really taken the world by storm. Uh, it's extremely powerful. I play with it not infrequently, but you can generate um, and uh, use this chatbot for a lot of different potential applications. Um, you can apparently take a picture, um, uh, chest X-ray and upload it. Uh, and it will give you a, a, a diagnosis um, with uh, something like multimodal GPT-4. So one of the um, uh, early applications is using it to write papers. Um, in fact, uh, uh, a radiologist uh, used it to uh, publish uh, four papers and actually disclosed this. So this is in our, our uh, um, uh, journal radiology, uh, and this particular um, fellow actually wrote uh, a paper, but then disclosed to the editor that he used ChatGPT to help write the papers uh, as a co-author. So various um, journals like Nature and Seisner are putting out guidelines about the use of uh, AI to uh, write um, essays and write publications and write grants and so on. So uh, interesting times that we, li that we live in. How can a radiologist like myself uh, use uh, ChatGPT? Um, I'll talk a little bit about this and its application in, uh, in healthcare. We can use um, ChatGBT for uh, patient inquiries. And we spend a lot of time answering the phone and speaking to patients on the phone. We can use it for uh, clinical decision making and clinical decision support. Um, we can also use it to um, uh, write uh, articles. Um, I've certainly played with it to uh, um, find interesting and exciting uh, titles for research articles and research grants. Um, can it help with uh, structuring and formatting um, papers and formatting the, the bibliography of, of, um, of a paper. Certainly many potential applications um, for, uh, for something like ChatGPT. Um, I guess as an introduction, I want to quickly um, review some of the broad categories of, of AI and machine learning, learning in terms of uh, medical imaging. So we could probably divide it into six groups. We can use AI for clinical decision support uh, where um, uh, we can figure out what might be the best uh, management um, or best test for a patient. We can use it to uh, acquire images for image reconstruction. Um, we can use it for image processing uh, and uh, make an image look um, uh, much nicer and higher resolution. We can use it to automatically segment and detect abnormalities. So if they're very subtle, tumors or brain tumors or very subtle abnormalities that I'll show may not even be visible to the human eye, we can train an AI model to detect this. We can classify disease and outcomes using uh, radiomics. And then finally, there are products out there that can actually provide a uh, AI report for a medical imaging uh, scan that you may have had. These are some applications um, in, the, in the real world um, that relate to neuroscience. Um, that uh, we had been and, and currently, in fact, are still working on. Um, we have a project that was um, uh, supported and funded by MIME um, to use AI to detect uh, changes longitudinally in patients with multiple sclerosis. This is a project um, uh, with Zhong Yuan Yi looking at um, detecting uh, uh, liver cancer uh, and Majid Ama. Uh, ben Sinclair is a, uh, a research fellow with a lab that's um, developing a model to detect a very subtle focal cortical dysplasia in patients with epilepsy. And this is in collaboration with Terry O'Brien and Patrick Kwan. So patients that have epilepsy, sometimes the lesions are very difficult for us to detect. And so Ben is uh, developing a model to, uh, to do that. I'll demonstrate some uh, deep learning generative models for improving image quality with uh, MRI. Uh, and this is with um, Gary Egan and uh, Zhao Lin Chen at um, uh, the Faculty of IT and Monitored Biomedical Imaging. Uh, and then very exciting images of how we're actually synthesizing high field MRI uh, and high resolution MRI from very low field point of care MRI. And then finally, at the end, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the ethical use of AI. What does it mean for the consumer? What does it mean for the per person who's ordering the test? Um, should we inform the patient and the consumer that we're actually using AI in their medical diagnosis and their medical imaging? And I think the answer to that is probably yes, but we often don't do it. Um, so we, we have collaborations with um, the Australian Epilepsy Project where we're uh, obtaining scans and then developing models to uh, make diagnosis of epilepsy. Um, and one of the first um, 
I guess we were one of the first in Australia to utilize uh, AI Doc, which is a commercial uh, product that can help detect um, uh, intracranial hemorrhage. And this is um, a project that um, uh, was published by one of my colleagues, Adil Zia. And essentially, it's uh, a tool that will detect uh, hemorrhage into the brain using AI Doc, and then it will then triage this to the top of the work list. So we look at it first. Uh, and this is um, a tool that's been FTA and TGA and CE cleared for clinical use. So we do a lot of CT scans at the Alfred, as you can imagine, uh, and our turnaround time is typically more than 65 minutes. But if you have an abnormal scan, this uh, <clears throat> AI will bring us to the top of the work list and ask us to report it first. So you can see that um, the, uh, the true positive and the false negatives um, uh, are reasonably low. Uh, and so we're reasonably confident to be able to use this uh, in the clinic. Here's an example of a case that I reported on the weekend and I didn't see anything, but the AI doc uh, and AI detected a, what was potentially a very subtle hemorrhage. This is the um, um, CALNC heat map uh, showing us where the hemorrhage was. The patient ended up having an MRI scan, which showed that in fact there wasn't a hemorrhage, but some uh, fungal infection. So in fact, it was a false positive, uh, but still flagged the abnormality for us uh, as humans to, uh, to look at. When we reviewed this, um, in fact, we found that um, uh, there were six or seven very subtle hemorrhages that we missed as humans, uh, but thankfully these were inconsequential. There was no clinical detriment, um, but again, demonstrating that it's potentially a very useful tool in clinical practice. Why is um, AI gonna be exciting? Well, um, the current technology for us, um, uh, this, is, this is actually a human brain that's been put in a post-mortem into a 16.4 Tesla animal scanner. You can see the resolution here is approaching that of microscopy 100 microns. Um, and as we reduce the um, uh, resolution of the uh, uh, scan to what it is in clinical imaging today, and this is one millimeter isotropic, you can see that the resolution really doesn't allow us to detect very subtle abnormality. Um, but the abnormality is still there. And obviously if we had the resolution to detect it, uh, we would still detect it. So a big concept in AI for medical diagnosis is to actually use the gold. The gold standard is probably microscopy. And these are some images from, um, say, a clarity microscopy uh, image where the pathology is seen by a microscope, but not necessarily seen by the human eye. But because of the, it's there, so this is a patient that may have Alzheimer's disease, uh, they may have tau tangles that we don't really see on an MRI scan, but you can see it on microscopy. So we can use these microscopy scans to train an AI model to detect very subtle abnormalities that's not visible to the human eye. And I think that's where we're gonna to head to in the field of AI and medical imaging in particular. Um, and this is a, an example of, of how we can actually use AI to um, uh, synthesize um, contrast enhancements. So then you don't have to actually inject a patient with, uh, with contrast. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, this concept of training uh, AI to outperform humans um, is, not a new one. This is the Mass General Center for Clinical Data Science where they used um, uh, a higher resolution MRI scan to train a model to detect um, CT invisible strokes in patients. And they found that in fact, the um, deep learning uh, AI model uh, had a sensitivity of 96% compared to 66% for human neuroradiologists. So in fact, we're already demonstrating that you're able to um, develop and train a model that can be superior to humans in detecting abnormality that's not visible to the human eye, but certainly visible to an AI model that you might train. And this is now being done for things like lung cancers and lung nodules and so on. <clears throat> I want to spend a minute um, uh, just on a topic um, that we're working on with NASA. These are, the, these are blood vessels in the brain and surrounding these blood vessels are what we call these perivascular spaces, which are important for draining uh, the fluid and draining the toxins and um, uh, uh, rubbish, I guess, that can accumulate in the brain. And so these black dots here are things that might accumulate that could damage the brain and cause uh, Alzheimer's disease. And this is drained through the pathways in the neck and through the lymphatics in, in the brain. So we've um, uh, got a couple of PhD students. This is Will Pham, who's one of our students, who's looking at these perivascular spaces. And Will has developed um, a neural network um, uh, an AI, if you like, 
to detect uh, these perivascular spaces in the brain. And what we're finding in big, large data sets is that these perivascular spaces actually become smaller as we age. But not only that, if you, are, if you do have Alzheimer's disease, so the, the yellow curve versus the black curve, which is the normal controls, if you have Alzheimer's disease, then these perivascular spaces are felt to be uh, uh, smaller because they're less efficient at creating. And then we applied <clears throat> this methodology to um, uh, a project that we're doing with NASA, the European Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency, Roscosmos, where we scan uh, human controls who remain on Earth, uh, and then the Russian cosmonauts, as well as the NASA uh, astronauts that uh, spend more than six months uh, in the International, International Space Station. Um, you can um, uh, hear about this podcast uh, when we did an interview with um, uh, Stan Love, who's an NASA astronaut, as well as um, uh, Norman Swan and Tegan Taylor on this ABC podcast. Um, and what we had found was that, uh, interestingly, uh, these are the Russian cosmonauts. Uh, they had worn these lower negative uh, body negative pressure suits, which essentially sucks fluid from the brain into the lower extremities. The Russian astronauts, sorry, the American astronauts didn't do this. And what they found was, in fact, the um, perivascular spaces in the fluid in the brain was considerably higher than not only controls, but the Russian astronauts. So uh, important that we develop this methodology because the next mission um, may have seen that they've started sending civilians into space. Uh, and this um, year, they'll be sending uh, humans to the space station, um, civilians to the space station. And then later on, um, the uh, uh, Artemis plan is intending on potentially sending humans uh, to the moon for habitation. So part of this project is a Polaris Dawn project where we're gonna use this AI to segment and detect these perivascular spaces in the brain. And hopefully immediately after they've returned from earth, um, see what happens in the to the perivascular spaces. So this is, um, uh, I think the last couple of things I wanna talk about is the ability of AI to synthesize uh, very high resolution images. So this, this is a 64 millitesla, very low field point of care MRI. And you see the images are fairly blurry, uh, low resolution and not good signal to noise, but we've developed an AI now, um, a deep learning reconstruction. Uh, in fact, it's a generative reconstruction approach to take these very low field scans um, and then using the model, uh, synthesize these very high resolution, high field MRIs. Uh, and what this is like, well, on the left panel here is low, low field scans. On the right, um, well, in the middle are these real 3T scans, the high field scans. And on the right panel, are these synthesized, AI synthesized images. So you can see that in fact, they're very close to what the real high field images might look like, which is very exciting because then we can get to the point where we can synthesize potentially uh, microscopic quality images. Lastly, um, do we tell our patients that we're using AI in the clinic already? Well, if you had a Tesla, and I, I don't think the driverless option is um, activated in Australia, but a lot of my friends use it in America. And uh, you know who's responsible for uh, a car crashing if you're driving a Tesla and it crashes? Well, obviously, the responsibility lies both within the driver that's activated it and potentially the company that's developed it. And so it turns out that when we survey our patients in the clinic, um, uh, we gave them these questionnaires in the waiting room. 63% of them were unaware that we're using AI uh, in uh, uh, clinical practice. They were, however, reasonably comfortable that we're using AI as long as potentially we, we, talk, we tell them. And the accuracy of AI should be higher than 90%. Um, and uh, if it was higher than 90%, then they felt that they were comfortable in using AI in the medical diagnosis. And then when you ask them, um, you know, what, who's liable if something goes wrong and, we, and the AI makes a mistake? And the uh, majority of patients, 76%, in fact, um, said that the hospital or practice is liable. The computer company that developed the AI, 61%. The radiologist at the practice, 37%. And then the referring doctor that referred the patient to us, uh, 10%. And then finally, the last concept that I want to leave you with is a very controversial one, but potentially a very hot topic. So if you were a patient in a hospital and I used your patient for your clinical care and for research purposes, you'd have no problems with that whatsoever. Um, but we are using this data to develop um, AI models and uh, AI tools. Um, we're not using them to commercialize uh, products, but the minute that 
potentially a company is using uh, your data, uh, the patient's data to uh, commercialize and monetize an AI product, I think that um, that becomes very controversial and potentially patients um, you know, could and should um, have a share of, uh, of these companies. <laughs> So in summary, then, uh, I hope we've given you a, a, a quick review of some of the real-world applications of um, AI in, uh, in, the, in neuroscience, um, what we're using for um, currently in our clinical practice, what uh, some potential future applications may be, uh, particularly with epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, and brain tumors, and also mental health. Um, you know, we're potentially have abnormalities uh, for patients with uh, depression and um, schizophrenia and so on that we're trying to detect um, that's not necessarily visible with the human eye. And then finally, some ethics on what it means to the consumer uh, and patients um, with regard to AI. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Ming. Thank you. That's a very exciting range of topics. Very exciting. Um, we, we won't have time for uh, questions just at the minute for Ming, but you can obviously ask him those questions, make comments in the chat. I'll just get you to unshare your screen there for us, Ming. Yep. Thank you. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to our, our second speaker, Anton Isaacs, who's going to look at a really different uh, area and way that digital health is helping with. Uh, mental health. So over to you, Anton. Thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you, Professor Law. I absolutely enjoyed that. I felt like I was in a different universe. Um, uh, a dinosaur like me it was exposed to this, this wonderful um, world of uh, AI and, um, and uh, imaging and all that. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, what you're going to hear from me is quite different. Uh, it's a little more um, grassroots level kind of stuff. Uh, I'm a public health physician and I have been, uh, for the last 15, 20 years, I've been working on designing, uh, implementing and evaluating mental health services, uh, specifically services for disadvantaged communities. Indigenous people in, in Australia and rural people in India uh, and so on and so forth. More, more recently, I have been focusing on um, trying to make services for people with uh, very severe and enduring mental illness, more recovery focused. Uh, and the focus has been on um, trying to separate um, the medical uh, aspects of uh, somebody with um, severe mental illness from all the other social and psychosocial aspects. Now, um, two things I wanted to talk about today. The first one is uh, about the recent COVID-19 pandemic that we are all familiar with. And you know that Victoria went into a 101 day lockdown following that pandemic. Um, um, uh, and because of the, of the large number of people having to be homebound and not being able to go out, losing their jobs and so on and so forth, the, the amount of psychological distress in the community skyrocketed. And met, there was an increase, a significant increase in the number of people who were looking for services for their mental health problems. Now we refer to uh, people who come under the missing middle uh, what, what the missing middle refers to is uh, people who are not so sick or so ill that they need to get admitted or go to a, uh, to a psychiatrist, but who are a little more ill than what a GP can manage. So this group of people, we re really did not have anywhere that they could go to. And we had a large number of them. And you know, now we are fast entering the digital age. And because of that, um, the Australian government, Victorian government and the primary health networks got together and they decided that we need to do something quickly. We need to be able to improve access for people who have mental illness and who need to go and find some kind of help. So they came up with um, 
this program called Head to Health. Uh, Head to Health is a program I don't know if all of you are aware of, but um, it's a, you can Google it, it's all over the place. Um, and the Head to Health program, uh, the, the whole purpose of it was to establish some kind of um, online or digital uh, tool where anybody could call uh, a, a number, a 1-800 number, and it'll be picked up by somebody from, um, from any of the hubs of the Head to Health program that was spread out throughout the state. And these people manning these telephones were trained people. They were either social workers or they were um, psychologists or they were mental health nurses. And they followed. Uh, so when somebody calls, they have this online tool and I'll show you that online tool in a minute. Uh, let me just um, uh, share my screen with you. So this is, this is the initial assessment and referral decision support tool. It's, it's, it's freely available uh, online, but this was developed by the Australian government. And although it's, it's easily available online, this was the tool that was used by, uh, by those sitting at the phones. So if anybody calls, they will, and now these are all trained people who are sitting at the phones. They would, they have, Two domains. They have primary domains and they have contextual domains, and this has all been developed. And they ask them a series of questions, and they decide whether, for instance, when it comes to the severity of um, of the distress, whether they have no problems, middle, moderate, severe, or very severe. Then they go to the functioning, whether the functioning is you know mild, moderate, or severe. Then they go to the risk of harm harm to themselves, harm to others. You know, some of them can be, can have suicidal ideation and they want to, you know, harm themselves. There are rarely situations where people with severe mental illness want to harm somebody else. So all this is, is identified. Now remember this, the people doing this are all trained in, in, in how to use this and understand it. And of, of course, the impact of coexisting conditions, many of them might have other severe mental illness or the severe physical illness, like a cardiac problem or diabetes or something that they're not able to get help with. Uh, then they go into contextual domains, talking about treatment and recovery history and all that, uh, and family and other support. So whether they are supported well, they've got no supports, and then they move on to social and environmental stresses. So again, they, they, they decide, they choose between zero and four, and finally, they choose how well and motivated, how engaged they are and how motivated they are. Optimal, you know, all this. Finally, they, uh, they get a, uh, they are able to uh, uh, get a number and the number will decide based on what we call a stepped care approach. So whether when it's one or two, then it's, they, they are referred to either some kind of online um, program where they can, you know, access it online and try and um, find answers to some of their problems. If it becomes three, then they have to see a psychologist. And there are psychologists available, um, and the psychologist will decide how many sessions to do. If it goes to four or five, they are straight away referred to the to uh, acute mental health services, um, uh, either the psychiatrist or the uh, or the emergency medicine or whatever it is. And usually when they are four or five, they are, you know, very, very ill, mentally ill. Um, and uh, so this is the program and the program's running now. Now it's gone on all over Australia. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because in Gippsland, where we work, the uh, the primary health network invited us to evaluate the program uh, that was running in Gippsland. And um, we, uh, we have published some papers on the program, but specifically on the use of the IAR DST tool. I'm in the, in the final process of getting the paper published. And I don't think that there is much uh, known about using this kind of tool on a public health basis uh, in Australia. Um, I think the, the paper, <clears throat> Using tele telehealth itself in Australia, <clears throat> excuse me, 
on a large scale um, has been relatively new. And using this digital tool has been even uh, more uh, advanced. Now, what I found was um, it worked beautifully. People were very happy. Uh, it worked much better for some people than for other people. There were situations where if somebody is very, un, um, very unwell and they have been sitting in their house for a long time and not had any contact with anybody, uh, talking to somebody on the phone all of a sudden made them uh, uh, exacerbated their symptoms. Or um, <clears throat> young people preferred uh, to use the telephone when they were talking rather than video conferencing. Some groups enjoyed it, some groups did not quite anyway, but overall it was really good. But what stood out was that many of these people needed to be referred to other services, not only to mental health services, but to GPs, to um, non-governmental organizations. And there was no way they could do that because this is a, um, um, this is a um, web-based program that works by itself. It does not speak to anything else. Now, GPs use uh, the medical director software for their patients. And anybody who's on medical director, if they, get the, if they get the code, they can access the details of each patient. But if you are not in GP land, but patient needs your assistance, for example, needs housing or needs um, some other kind of care, and they need to know something about your health, there's no way they can know unless they ask the GP and the GP gives them, sends it to them. And even if they want to transfer somebody to who they have identified through this program to another um, clinician or another agency, they have to prepare separately an entire report on what they have done and take a printout and give it to the patient or send it by email. That's a big problem. It takes a lot of time. And both, both those organizations that were running this program, as well as the clinicians who used the IAR DSD, said it is very difficult for us to be able to share data across different agencies. And I think one of the main uh, areas of research that are going forward will be to develop some way by which all these agencies can talk to each other. The, the information that they develop or they gather from each patient can be, can be shared. Of course, they'd have to follow all confidentiality um, rules and regulations, but this is a big problem now, especially when we are going into this digital age. In Netherlands, uh, which is very similar to their, their primary health net, um, primary care practices are very similar to us. In the USA, they have large um, medical centers, multiple general practitioners. They have large number of you know, staff. They have nurses, they have social workers, they have allied health professionals all under one roof. So their primary health care centers are very large. Compared to Australia, Australia, we have one of a few more general practitioners within one general practice. They may have a few nurses, maybe one or two allied health practitioners and so on and so forth, but much smaller than they have in, uh, in the USA. In the Netherlands, what they have done is, they, have, they face the same problem, but what they have done is they have developed a, uh, a web-based uh, platform that is parallel, that runs above everybody else's systems, but everybody can go into can, can upload data or documents to that platform and download documents from that platform. Of course, it is um, with, with codes and with passwords and all that. So something like that, if we can have in, in, our, in, in Australia, will make it very easy for multiple organizations to work. We're talking about intersectoral collaboration now to be able to provide the best possible care for our, for our patients. And unless multiple organizations are able to talk to each other in a, in a, in a much more uh, easier way, that's going to be quite challenging. It is continuing to be challenging. And that's why these things have not worked out in many parts of the world, including in the UK. Uh, so that's the first thing I wanted to talk, talk about today. The second thing that I wanted to talk 
is very specifically about my area of interest, which is um, recovery focused care. Now, people with very severe mental illness, we know that um, they, the, if they want to recover from severe mental illness, it's not just about um, um, reduction in their, uh, in, their, uh, in their symptoms. It's also about living a, uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, uh, a useful, productive, you know, um, uh, communal life where they are connected to people, connected to society, whether they can spend their day doing something, so on and so forth. And research has shown that even if they do not have complete control over their symptoms, if they have all these other things, they are, they are able to uh, live a pretty decent life. And uh, I recently received um, a MIME grant. MIME stands for Monash Institute of Medical Engineering. They, um, they give money for people uh, to collaborate between the health sciences and IT, come together and develop solutions for, to improve healthcare for people. And we are developing a recovery app um, where people can enter their own data into their app and have an idea of where they're going, what works, what doesn't work, when did they, in the course of time, what made them get worse, what made them get better, um, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And one of the things that um, uh, people with severe mental illness have told me is that when they go and see their doctors, they, nobody really tells them what exactly is wrong with them Nobody takes them seriously. They just say, oh, yeah, you, you've got severe mental illness. I'm the doctor. I will tell you what to do, what not to do. Uh, I'm not going to take what you say. Uh, I'm going to take it with a pinch of salt. So they feel really disrespected. Uh, and from listening to their stories, um, I, have come, I came up with this idea of developing an app where they can document everything they want to document. Because in the medical records, only what the clinician wants to document is documented, irrespective of what the patient says. So this is an opportunity for the patient to document everything that they feel is important to them, and they can transfer that to the clinician. So it is on record. So nobody can say this did not exist. So this is the way I'm, I'm trying to build um, empowerment within people with severe mental illness. So, these are the two important things that I wanted to share with you today. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anton. Very interesting. E equally important to the healthcare system, to the things we've heard from Ming. Um, and we might have a chance to drill down on that patient contribution to their records a bit later in the questions. I'm interested to hear a bit more about that, and I'm sure others are too. Um, uh, I'll now hand over to our third speaker, who's uh, Associate Professor Levin Coleman. You can share your screen with us, please, Levin. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Hear you fine and see your slides. That's great. Yeah. So I can start? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So today I'll be talking about neurophysiological process imaging. And I guess I'll just go through the slides. So basically we want to image neural mechanisms of the brain and current imaging techniques basically image uh, uh, blood oxygenation changes or current source um, estimates, like electrical current source estimates in terms of functional brain imaging. And so they're not directly measuring or imaging neurophysiological variables. Um, you know, if you're not familiar with neurons, things like membrane potentials, uh, postsynaptic potentials, these are common components of neurophysiology, and they're also important for understanding neurophysiological information processing. Um, in terms of trying to do this in humans, we're sort of restricted with current imaging techniques, and then trying, if we want to image the neurophysiological variables, um, we have to use basically mathematical models of the brain to uh, image to infer the, the, the neurophysiological variables from the measurements we have. So people have done that with fMRI, that's called dynamic causal modeling. Um, and then uh, people have also done it with EEG and MEG, and we're trying to do that more with EEG and MEG because it gives you the time resolution. And so we've developed two different methods 
to infer these neurophysiological variables um, using either a specific version of the Kalman filter um, or an LSTM uh, based filter as well. And so we've used these two different methods to, to study the resting state and also basically look at the correlation in real time between our estimates of neurophysiological variables and um, other variables of interest, um, such as the alpha power and the resting state. And, um, and then we've applied the LSTM filter uh, to epilepsy and compared it to the Kalman filtering approach as well. So I'll talk about those two things today. So as I was saying before, um, you know, we want to image neural mechanisms. fMRI, MEG, and EEG are providing direct measures of the neurophysiological variables that are doing all the computations in the brain. Um, and we're, but at the same time, we want to image those variables, but we're also limited by current imaging techniques on the resolution we can image. And so if we're dealing with MEG and EEG, we're sort of resolution across the cortex. So if we look at this image down here, um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not. Can you see my cursor? Yes, we can. Yeah. So um, we might start out here with the MEG and we have sensors positioned around the head and around the brain. Right? And then um, those MEG sensor signals can be beam formed or source reconstructed down to cortical sites and those sites you know with current resolution we have about six millimeter spacing so you end up with like four thousand cortical sites uh, from which you get current source estimates through inverse uh, source reconstruction with the MEG and so what we want is to assume that at each of these sites we have like a, a neurophysiological model that gives rise to the current source signal, the source dipole, which is proportional to the, we assume that it's proportional to uh, the pyramidal cell population. And so, you know, with neurons and neurophysiology, we know that there's like within like a six millimeter patch of cortex, there's like millions of neurons. Um, and all we can do to simplify that situation. And then we lump them together in what's called a, a neural mass model. And so at each grid point in the cortex, we assume that there's a neural ma mass model that gives rise to the current source signal that we can estimate using the MEG beam forming. And so in the model that we assume, we use what's called the Janssen rip model, which includes a pyramidal population, excitatory stellate, into neurons and inhibitory into neurons. And so we know in cortex, it's much more complicated. There's many more cell types, but when you're trying to um, deal with the problem of inference, so basically trying to estimate variables of, model, of models from, from data, you always have this problem of non-uniqueness of solutions. And the more variables you have to estimate, the, the harder it is to estimate them accurately. So you just try and simplify the situation by assuming you've got a simple model of what's going on in the cortex. And so we're just assuming this is an accurate model of the cortex. People have done studies to assess whether it's accurate. At the end of the day, it's probably only accurate within certain contexts, certain applications like this one specifically has been developed to model the resting state or alpha rhythm. Um, yeah, so you can come up with different models that might explain the EEG or MEG features in different ways. Um, and But obviously you want to try and have the simplest model that explains the data the best. And so, you know, our framework sort of focuses on this model. And so each population uh, has its own membrane potential, mean membrane potential, and it can generate an, an output firing rate following a sigmoidal transfer function. And then uh, the inputs or the membrane potential of a given population is generated by its inputs. So here we have a cortical input, which is a, the ex, like the sum of all external inputs to this cortical site. And then we have, um, here we have an inhibitory to pyramidal population synapse or population level synapse. And here we have an excitatory to pyramidal population level synapse. 
And so the connection strength uh, of this population average synapse um, is represented by this alpha variable here, which is just the height of this connectivity kernel. So this sort of represents a bulk uh, representation of the synapse. And these neural mass models are only an approximation of what's actually going on. Um, you know, if we try and imagine creating population models of you know hundreds of thousands or millions of cells within a cortical patch, but in any case, they give us potentially can give us insight into understanding what's going on. And so we focus on the Kalman filter because it gives us time-resolved estimates of these variables. So um, just to give you a picture, we uh, did this anesthesia study where we collected data from the MEG, and then we beamformed basically the current source signals to the MEG source points. And then we apply our Kalman filter or Bayesian inference scheme that's based on neural mass models uh, to obtain variables of estimates from the neurophysiology. And then we can do statistical analysis of our estimates, you know, and project it onto the MRI images um, to see how these neurophysiological variables are changing. Oops. So I think I moved the wrong slide here, but I'm just going to skip the method. If you've got questions at the end, we can come back to it. So um, the basic idea is, which we saw from the previous picture, was we have this model that we're assuming is at every cortical site. So we have 4,000 cortical sites. And then for a, a given example, we pick a, a single cortical site. We look at the MEG signal, um, or the, basically the, yeah, the MEG signal at that site. Probably should be current, not millivolts, but anyway. Um, and then we can look at the alpha signal. If we just fit, brought a like, bandpass filter, the alpha signal from this original MEG signal at a given cortical site. And so here we can see how that changes with time in, in the resting state. And then and basically what happens, we have this MEG signal, current source signal, and we feed it into the analytic common filter that we've developed specifically for these neural mass models and for the non sigmoidal nonlinearity. And it helps us estimate these physiological variables. So here we have the estimate of the cortical input to this site, single site. So that's this mu variable. And then here we have our estimates of the excited to pyramidal connection strength. So that's this variable here. And then we can also estimate the pyramidal population mean membrane potential VP hat, which is this variable here. And so we can do that for all these other variables that we have depicted in in the neural mass model. We can see that some of the estimates take a, a while to converge, whereas some of them converge fairly quickly. Um, and so these are properties of the filters that you develop. Um, they might not converge quickly, but once they converge, they're fairly stable and can give you stable estimates. And so one of the issues you might ask is what's the ground truth here? We have no idea what the ground truth is because we're dealing with human data. You can do forward simulations and verify that the neural mass model works and the filter works with forward simulations of the neural mass model um, and you get accurate estimates. But once you start applying the filter to raw data, then you don't really have a ground truth. You're trusting in the accuracy of the model and you're trusting in the accuracy of the filter. Um, but basically if we, do these estimates at all the sites on the cortex, then we can basically have a way to image neurophysiological variables um, that are present in the neural mass models. And so here we're just looking at the contrast of the times when there's high alpha power versus the times when there's low alpha power and during the resting state and basically have a predominant posterior alpha rhythm in the posterior calcium cortex and those sorts of areas. And then this figure on the left is just contrasting the times when there's high and low alpha power. And here in these figures here, we show basically the significant uh, changes in the external input for high versus low alpha power. And this is the external input variable to the given cortical.
call location. So this mu variable here. And then uh, another variable that shows significant changes in inhibitory membrane potential, pyramidal membrane potential, and an excitatory interneuron membrane potential. And so these are all showing after correction for multiple comparisons. So the other physiological variables didn't show significant changes with this contrast approach. And here we can see the external input is probably the main factor that contributes to this posterior, strong posterior alpha rhythm. Um, and then what you can also do, because we have the time resolved information, so we've got the alpha signal here, and then we have the neurophysiological variable time series, you can actually look at the correlation between those variables. And then you can image uh, which correlations are significant across the brain. And so this is a new way of imaging you know, physiological function in a time resolved way. And, um, and we get this additional information compared to the contrast imaging. If we just look at see that this strong correlation, whoops, we see this strong correlation here, posterior in sort of primary visual cortex, but then we see this negative correlation here with the alpha power in this frontal region, which is something we didn't see in this contrast imaging. And so basically we just got a new way to image, image brain function. We don't have the ground truth. So how you address that, you can ask me after the talk, I guess. The last thing I wanna talk about is just another way of trying to do the same thing. Uh, but instead using LSTM neural networks. So these are uh, very popular form of deep learning. And basically the idea is uh, we again wanna estimate the variables of the neural mass model. And we assume that the pyramidal population memory potential is proportional to uh, either the current signals or the EEG signal that we add the LCM filter to, to, um, uh, to EEG data. And so it, one of the benefits of making this LSTM filter is you don't need to initialize the filter, whereas for common filtering, you have to guess what the initial values of these variables are. Um, you do have to initialize the LSTM. You don't need to initialize anything. It just gives you its best estimate based on what the data looks like. So that's one of the advantages of it. Um, yeah, so we sim for, simulate the neural mass model to provide a training set for the LSTM filter. And then we basically get the filter to learn the relationship between the... the he may well have dropped right out there. It looks like he's dropped right out there. Uh, apologies about that, everyone. Um, I'm hoping we shall get him back because somebody's raised an interesting question about the um, the um, implications of that functional model that Levin was talking about, which we can come back to in a minute. Present. Uh, everyone can see my slides, I presume. Um, so uh, not as yet. Not as yet. Uh, sorry, one sec. Where is it? Now we can, thank you. There we go, perfect. All right, um, th thanks for the opportunity to speak and it's been really interesting listening to the other speakers insights so far. Um, my title today is um, the highs and lows of health data. I've called it bipolar. And as I work through this, little presentation, you'll understand why I've used the word bipolar. Um, I'm Shainal, I'm the Outcome Health CEO. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself and my health journey, a bit about Outcome Health and Polar, the highs and lows of data. I'm going to show you a very brief Polar demonstration on some of the dummy data that we have, and then I'll give a bit of time for everyone to ask me some questions regarding my presentation. So I'll start with a little bit about me. So I'm the CEO of Outcome Health. I, I joined Outcome Health in February, so fairly new in the role, just under six months. Um, I was previously working at Dedalus Health, which was previously DXC Technology, which at the time was the third biggest healthcare vendor for hospital software in the world. And my role there was as the APAC clinical 
advisor and principal clinical advisor for the APAC region. I'm a medical doctor by background. I, I first studied and worked in South Africa. Um, I studied at Kruderskia Hospital, where interesting was the place for the first um, human heart transplant. And then I worked in regional um, South Africa for a few years before moving to Australia, where I worked at the Alfred Hospital in psychiatry. And while I was working in psychiatry at the Alfred Hospital, I, I wore a few hats. So I was an adjunct lecturer for Monash University. I lectured the fourth year uh, medical psychiatry program, and I ran clinical trials for both Monash University and Alfred Hospitals. Um, I, I ran a clinical trials research center focusing on uh, pharmacology um, clinical trials, focused mostly on um, mental health, in particular women's mental health. I've I was a digital health strategy and operations consultant for Deloitte, um, where I spent most of my time, despite being a Melbourne-based employee, spent most of my time um, interstate, um, in particular at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Um, when it was open, we wrote the digital strategy for that hospital, and I helped with the optimization of their Eden workflow. I've studied an associate fellowship in medical administration, and I've recently completed my Harvard degree in executive leadership in healthcare. I'm a board member of Colac Area Health, and I'm a board member of a residential aged care facility in South Melbourne, and I chair the Australian Institute of Digital Health um, Victorian branch. So I'm gonna take you back on a bit of a time machine to the year 1992, and most of you, um, will be familiar with this image. And um, by the content of the first presentation, I, I think there's a few movie buffs amongst our panelists as well today. So interesting themes coming up here. So this was me, I was six years old, it was 1992. And this was two months after I had um, sustained a bicycle accident and injured myself. I had fractured my skull and I was placed in an induced coma for two months. And at the time, as you can imagine, healthcare in South Africa was, you know, far behind the world. And healthcare at that stage in 1992 was nothing like what it is right now. So I was intubated, put in an induced coma, and I was told, well, I wasn't told anything because I was unconscious, but my parents were told by the neurosurgeon and the ICU team that they have no idea in what state I'll wake up in, and there weren't many tests to help them determine that. Lo and behold, after two weeks in ICU in a coma, um, I was extubated and, and um, remained in ICU and a few days later discharged the ward. And I woke up and I just said to my mom, um, where's my brother, where are my cousins? Why the hell am I in hospital? So it was a huge relief for my family when they realized that there was no brain injury um, and there was no permanent damage from a mental, mental point of view. Um, but I do still sustain um, some physical damage from that accident. So the moral of that story is um, my father will always say is make sure that your kids wear a bicycle helmet when they are riding a bike and make sure that you check their bike cables regularly. Because what had happened to me was I was going down the hill at a rapid pace. Um, I was extremely confident on my bike and, you know, rode it for many hours of the day, like most kids did. And unfortunately, my brake cable failed on my back and, you know, surprisingly on my front brake as well. And I had no brakes and I went straight into a wall. Um, so what does this have to do with um, digital health and, and mental health and, and data in particular? So I, I guess my story is a reflection of what the healthcare system was like back then. So everything in healthcare then was almost everything was done on paper. Um, notes were written on paper. We had physical files um, to refer someone to another department or to get a scan done. Either someone physically walked down a piece of paper or they picked up the phone and called and then sent down that person or, or patient with a piece of paper or they faxed information through. And I can tell you now the fax machine is not dead. There still are some hospitals not, not in developing countries, but in Australia that still use fax machines. Research and data gathering was an extremely manual process. Um, so that was 1992. 
I'm not even certain what they did then, but when I was a medical student and an intern um, in the early 2000s, and I was gathering data for research, a lot of the data I was gathering was done by going to the files room, requesting certain files, and then manually going through each paper record and trying to establish uh, retrospective data. And it was a painstakingly painful process, um, which really hindered a lot of good research at the time. But despite all of that, you know, healthcare was moving forward and research was still happening. In 1992 in South Africa, computers were, were new and not widely used in healthcare. And funnily enough, the first use of um, computers in healthcare was as you can imagine, follow the money when billing software was introduced and patients needed to bill private patients. But it, it wasn't all doom and gloom then. Um, in my view, clinicians reacted quicker. They used their gut and instincts and patient care and the amount of patients that they saw to make decisions. They weren't completely reliant on technology. They weren't completely reliant on randomized control trials and, and data to make decisions. A lot of it was anecdotal. Um, be it safe, be it unsafe, but a lot of the anecdotal research occurred by clinicians purely because they did not have the data to back themselves up, but they had had great experience and seen thousands of patients. And importantly, there was no computer screen or piece of technology dividing the interaction between the clinician and the patient. Um, interestingly enough, um, there were some great technological advancements coming out at the time. So um, I, I was one of the first people in South Africa to go under an MRI scan after I was extubated and taken out of ICU to see the, whether there was any permanent damage to my brain. Thankfully not. Um, at that, in 1992, the safety cannula for IV intravenous cannula, cannulization was introduced as well, as well as an auto IV pump. Um, intubation and anesthesia were common practice. Pulse oximeter, oximetry was in pretty much every ICU and the IV bags, which we are used to seeing now hanging up on um, IV stands were introduced in 1990 as well. And ICU was slowly becoming electronic with um, monitoring devices such as op pulse oximetry, blood pressure cuffs, et cetera, um, where they were feeding into a, a digital source, but very, very green at that stage. So what, what did this experience tell me? Um, as a young six-year-old, I became obsessed with medicine. Um, I believe that the neurosurgeon and the medical team saved my life. And pretty much from that day onwards, I said to my parents, um, I'm going to do everything it takes to become a doctor. And lo and behold, I became a doctor. But what was happening with my data at that point? Um, I was seeing neurosurgeons, I was seeing neurologists, I was seeing physiotherapists, I was seeing the GP, but essentially none of that data was being linked between those services. Often I would be sitting in the waiting room or I'd be in the rooms of whether it be my specialist or GP and they would pick up the phone and call each other and have a, you know, a short five minute case conference on my, my presentation, some of my progress. And, and often that didn't happen because um, the other doctor or physiotherapist was currently with another patient and that moment would pass and I would have my clinical consult with um, my specialist or my therapist and um, my consult time will be over and I'd move on and that, that communication would probably be held for the next time I went into the GP clinic. Um, so, so there was no transfer of data, there was no um, electronic medical records and there was nothing happening with my data other than sitting in a file in, in the specialist or GP or physiotherapist room. So, you know, a lot has come a, a, a long way since then. And, you know, I, I, I received phenomenal care and it's testament to where I've come in my life right now, but I'm sure things have improved and particularly that transfer of data and the use of digital and health technology to improve healthcare has come on in leaps and bounds. So we'll get back into the time machine and, and we'll move into um, here and now. And I'll tell you a little bit about the organization um, I'm the CEO of. It's called Outcome Health. We are a not-for-profit organization and we are charity. Um, there are three main areas of our business, um, a clinical area, polar, and the Aurora research area. So our clinical area, we focus on mental health um, 
clinical services, and that's both in person, that's both in metropolitan regions and rural regions. So, um, Anton, you mentioned um, mental health care clinics in Gippsland. So, some of our nurses are running some of those mental health care clinics. We provide mental health care nursing to Ambulance Victoria and various other organizations such as universities and schools. And we run some of our own mental health care clinics, as well as a few chronic disease clinical services sites, such as diabetic education. In terms of Polar, the second arm of our business, Polar is a data extraction tool and an analytics platform. It's deployed in over 1,300 GP clinics across Victoria and New South Wales. And it is um, what we consider one of the best of breed data extraction and ana analytic tools in the market in Australia at the moment. And we are very proud of Polar. Um, it works in the sense that um, primary health networks procure licenses from Outcome Health, um, largely so this model, and they distribute them through their GP clinics in their PHN, and their GPs get access to some of the data that Polar is extracting. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and the third arm of our business is Aurora Research, which is an ethics-based ecosystem which conducts research. So Aurora is fairly closely tied with the polar part of our business as Aurora is reliant on some of the data that we receive from the data extraction and analytics we do in the polar product. Um, however, Aurora is also uh, constantly partnering with other organizations and universities such as Monash University, Macquarie University, La Trobe University, um, some of the hospitals and independent researchers to do research based on the primary care data that um, we are extracting from the tool um, with our Polar tool. This data is um, considered to be owned by the primary health network. So we often have partnerships with the primary health networks to access the data. And we hope to improve population outcomes and quality of care through the research we do in Aurora with the data that's extracted through Polar. So Polar has um, currently, when I checked today, 46 million non-unique patient records across the platform. Um, when they are individualized to individualized patients, we have 15 million unique patient records across uh, 1,325 sites and just under 1,500 locations. We extract up to 400 fields of data from GP clinical informatics systems. So we integrate with medical director, best practice, ZMed, and we extract about 400 fields from their, from their practice software, the demographic information, billing information, clinical records, um, health variation information as well. So we have approximately 70% of the extracted Victorian GP data and approximately 30% of the extracted Australian GP data in the polar system. So I'll just give you a, a brief little tour of what Polar looks like. Um, so this is a web-based tool, Polar. Um, there's a few things that I'll show you. So um, first we have um, sort of your, your clinical summary where you can have dashboards for your um, practice managers, for your clinicians. Um, and, and this can also be aggregated to the PHNs to, to look at a, a variety of, of clinics. Um, we can go into uh, clinical diagnostics. So, you know, interestingly enough, we can uh, either select the nervous system here, and that will show us um, what sort of conditions the GP has put in. So, you know, for example, back pain, pain, knee pain, et cetera, but what it maps out to a SNOMED term. Um, but, you know, we, we could also show um, the mental health conditions within the polar data infrastructure. So, for example, um, the highest seen diagnosis, again, this is dummy data, is depression, anxiety, mixed anxiety, you know, bipolar, PTSD, schizophrenia. And then, then you can draw that down into, you know, even further detail um, and into sort of very, very patient-centric data. Um, so from that, we can see in our mental health group with depression, what sort of the age categories of um, the dummy data has um, how many patients are in this count. So 1,556, 991 are active, 
for example, which suburbs they live in, whether it's male or female, their ethnicity, um, and various other data fields that we can pull out um, from there. So that, that's just an, a very brief overview of our clinical summary. Um, then we can look at sort of hospitalization risk. So the polar dashboard can also show you patients within your practice or within your PHN, if it's aggregated to that level, who are at urgent risk. So we've, we've assigned points and scores uh, using a scoring system that we developed, depending on their condition, they assigned a point. And, and as you can see, someone like um, Mr. Andrews has, you know, a very urgent need to see his GP. He's scored two points for mental health, chronic pain, drug and alcohol problems. And then you can, you know, click on the person and, and see exactly what those elements are, what they're presenting clinical symptoms are, and where they've scored their points. Um, Alternatively, you know, you can look at sort of your high risk patients, your medium risk patients, and, and obviously your low risk patients. But if, if I take you back to sort of your urgent risk, um, importantly, our, our GPs, our practice manager can have a look at what uh, MBS services are available to these patients. And um, we can see which ones of them have been claimed. Um, and if we look further to the right here, we can see, you know, for example, um, the MBS items for a GP mental health plan. And then we can sort and filter by this to see who has a plan, who has an active plan, um, and, and whether they're eligible for plan or whether there's an anomaly. So, you know, for example, Alyssa has fully claimed her plan for the year, whereas um, Virginia is um, the second patient on our list is currently under a mental health care plan. Um, and, and these patients don't have a mental health care plan. So from a clinical perspective, you can start bringing in these patients and starting them on, a, on an assessment to see if they uh, require a mental health care plan. And because they have urgent risk, um, you can see you know, why it's important for our GPs to see them. Essentially, we're trying to prevent um, hospitalization of these patients by using risk analysis and risk scoring systems to, to see them more urgently. So that, that's just a very brief overview of Polar. Um, I can spend hours showing you Polar, but in the interest of time, you know, that's just a, a little bit about what our dashboards look like, what sort of data we collect, and what we can do with the data. Importantly for the PHNs, um, they sort of have reporting data that um, they need to report up um, to their funders, which are the, the federal government. So they have quality metrics on um, certain categories. So we provide them with those metrics as well, which they uh, then utilize to report back up to the department, uh, the, the, fe the federal government. Um, so just going back to my presentation. So despite you know, where we've come with data and, and what we've, we've been able to do with data, we still have data challenges and we still have an inability um, at some point to do exceptional research and, and to actually improve quality of care. And, in my view, you know, we are doing exceptional work, but there are still a few pain points that um, we wish to address and, and we hope um, becomes so something that will help research in the future. So most clinical services are still fragmented and decentralized, particularly in Victoria and particularly in Australia. There's very little data linkage between practices, between GP data and the hospital services. So for example, GPs use clinical software such as best practice and medical director, which Polar is integrated into. Ambulance services have um, their own specific EMR tools that capture data while the patient's in an ambulance. The Ambulance Victoria service have their own clinical tools. And then again, the hospitals have their own EMRs such as Cerner and Epic and the likes of. Unfortunately, there is no intertwining or collaboration of that data at this point. Um, but I do think the future is moving in that direction to pull those data sets together and have a more holistic um, longitudinal patient record. With all of that, though, um, one of the biggest challenges we're facing is the ever-growing security threat um, and, and the use of data and the Privacy Act and, and where the data can be shared as freely as we would like it to be shared. Unfortunately, that is still going through um, 
some of the legislature changes, but um, we are hopeful that those linkages of data through um, the right policies will be made available. You know, look, in an ideal world, we'd want to have sort of a cradle to grave view of a patient. So, you know, someone like me who had a traumatic head injury when I was six years old, I would want to be able to have my medical records. I'd want to be able to take that to, you know, the various conditions as I see throughout my life. I want that, you know, data to be shared in a safe, secure way so that when I do go to consultations and appointments, my results are there, my imaging is there. And, and my story is already told. In particular, with things like MRI and brain scans, um, it's important to see what my baseline is. But you know, un unfortunately, my case is unusual because I moved from a, from South Africa to here, so I don't ever expect my data to be here. But I'm sure there's many examples of people who um, are born and lived their entire life in Australia that have had scans and, and tests done in in their childhood that will fundamentally impact um, some of their treatment um, today. So, you know, I, I do believe the patient journey through health can be improved. Um, I think we have an exceptional set of data that is in Australia that, that we do collect, whether it be through the likes of um, Outcome Health and Polar, or whether it be the likes of um, EMR software vendors or the likes of VAHI or AIHW, or even research institutes like Monash University, the Alfred Hospital, um, and various other hospitals across the country. You know, my view is that with this data, we should be collaborating more effectively. And I think, you know, again, there's a lot of good happening with the data. So as I, you know, called my presentation, the bipolar um, presentation, the highs and lows of data. So, you know, I wanted to present a little bit of a balanced view of where we act with data and how much, how far we've come since, you know, 1992 when I was a young kid in hospital to, you know, 2023 where we're extracting more than um, 500 fields of data from clinical software, you know, across just in our organization, 15 million active patients, you know, covering, you know, 30% of the entire Australian population. And, you know, there are other organizations that do the same. So between us, we probably have about 80% of the GP clinical data. And, you know, if we collaborate, that's that's a huge, powerful tool that we can use to do incredible research and fundamentally change population health and shape the outcomes of uh, clinical care in the future. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And there's just a little QR code down there if you want to scan and connect with me on LinkedIn and you know follow up this conversation I'm, I'm happy to you know take it offline as well thank you thank you very much Chanel that's wonderful I, I'm fortunate to know quite a bit about polar already but I'm hoping um, that talk today has opened the eyes of a whole bunch of other people uh, in the community about polar it really is a wonderful um, and well-governed resource and gives us a picture of uh, general practice care that not many places in the country can provide. So that's wonderful. You've got a whole uh, bunch of questions you can answer there, Shane. Now I'll get you to do that in the in the written form if that's okay. Um, I'm just we'll come circle back to some more comments from you in a minute. I'm conscious. I think that Levin needs to duck off uh, shortly. I'm hoping you can hear us, okay, Levin, and we can hear you all right again. Yep. Yeah, cool. Okay, Levin. So um, thank you for answering some of those questions I saw before. If I'm understanding correctly, Levin, I'm just trying to translate for some of our audience, what your the pathway you're following with your functional imaging is to give us um, a, a more detailed and alternative way of seeing the function of the brain originating in um, the electrical signals of the brain, correct? is a dynamical brain disease so uh, that's a good example of where you can understand um, or use these sorts of models to dynamically image what's going on epileptic brain activity might propagate or um, and then you can do that in individuals um, using these sorts of imaging techniques on an individual patient specific basis um, you might apply it in other areas where dynamics are important so uh, one of the other areas we study is anesthesia 
and try and understand the brain mechanism of anesthesia because uh, EEG is heavily a medical area where EEG is used heavily. Um, you might use it to study sleep as well, sleep disorders. EEG is used pretty heavily there um, to try and understand what are the, the brain mechanisms underlying these different aspects of the brain. If I if I spitball Evan, might you even in the future be able to use that as a correlate to to objective function of somebody recovering from a stroke, for instance? You could not only see what they can functionally perform, but you can see how their brain is functioning at a more micro level from that kind of technique. Yeah, you could be monitoring their their you know, movement control of whatever they're trying to do during re rehabilitation and then image the neurophysiological mechanisms of it, understand it better. Excellent. Thank you, Lemon. Thank you. Thanks for persisting. Um, I'll, I know you're around for a few more minutes. So again, for our audience, just keep a uh, keep the questions coming in. Looks like Shane is very busy answering a whole bunch of questions currently, but that's all right. I'm quickly typing away to try and get to as many of these as possible. <laughs> Did you want to just quickly verbally touch on some of that too, Shana? Yeah, so so look, a lot of a few of the questions are about Polar as a platform and 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 what does it actually do? So, you know, we the, the main focus of Polar was built to extract data from GP software. And that that data was then utilized by primary health networks to make decisions, help reporting, help commission services. But as a product grew, we, we developed functionality in it that practice managers and actual clinicians would start using. So it would give live data directly back to the clinicians or the practice manager through a tool called Walrus or through the, the web-based dashboards that I, I very briefly showed you. So in that sense, it was helping with bringing up prompts. So for example, if a patient who's 65 years old, who's female, who comes in for a GP consult for, you know, call it a hypertension assessment, Walrus can then prompt that GP to say, hey, guess what? This patient is also due a bowel cancer screening test, a mammogram, a blood test, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so those are the clinical indicators, but also then we can tie them to, you know, this patient is also eligible for these Medicare rebates for those tests or these plans based on their, their current diagnostic criteria. Um, and interestingly enough, we can build prompts as well for patient recruitment for clinical trials. So, you know, we can, we can filter out and screen out patients based on um, the inclusion and exclusion criteria written in uh, clinical protocols. Um, and that can create either a list or a dashboard for a practice manager, or it can actually create a prompt within the GP clinical consult to say, hey, Shainal's turned up for a, a clinical consult in, a, uh, you know, for a sore thumb, but hey, he actually meets the criteria for this hepatitis screening um, project. Uh, would you like to talk to him about it? So the functionality of Polo is growing and growing and growing. Um, by no means are we a clinical decision support tool, but we support clinical decisions, if that makes sense. We're not here to rewrite clinical textbooks, um, but with the information we're gathering, you know, we are starting to put the smarts together to actually see some trends in clinical data and trying to actually start evaluating whether that has a translational effect on clinical practice as well, particularly in that health variation piece. Um, so we, again, we work closely with GPs, researchers, and universities to sort of uh, unpack that information that we get. Um, I, I can tell you, Shane, from everything I've seen with the with the Polar platform and the team there, and then comparing it to hospital land, uh, there are many hospitals with EMRs that would kill for that closed loop that you have effectively. But yeah, that's, look, you know, and, and our with. vision is, um, you know, we've got a set of GP primary data, but Essentially, you know, Polar is an extraction tool that can sit in any piece of software. That, that's the way mm. we built it. The, mm. the smart side and actually what we translate and transform that data into, that's where the real power is. Yes. So, you know, we would love to work with um, hospital data or EMR software vendors to integrate with them and, and then close that healthcare loop of what's happening in primary care, what's happening in secondary care, what's happening at the ambulance level or in allied health. 
um, I think that's where the gold in the data is. And we, we're not a long way away from that, but we need a few things to happen that are outside of our control for that to really um, start happening. Yeah, no, very good. I'll, I'll, I'll let you get back to your, uh, they don't need to be essays, but <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. your links there. I'm going to come back to you, Anton. I'm just conscious Ming, I think, is also a ward service. So I might just ping him for a question before I come to you, Anton. And please, in the audience, keep firing questions through. We love seeing questions. Um, and, and there's a question for you, Anton, too, perhaps in the meantime from Ian Graham down your way. So, Ming, I'm, I'm really interested in the AI doc intracranial hemorrhage tool. So you've showed a few sort of metrics of its usage. Um, with, without telling me, I get the details. At some point, that kind of software has to be paid for somewhere. Are you seeing from the the evidence you've generated that you're able to sustain that into the future? That whatever it might cost in licensing, you're getting back in value, or is the value more in the the quality piece, which is hard to translate to dollars? Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so I have a five-hour response to that question, Chris. Um, <laughs> half a day workshop discussing it. So the, it's very complex, <clears throat> um, and it's kind of country dependent, and also um, the kind of practice that it's being applied to. So the the, the quick answer is that um, in prior practice radiology, where um, you know you need to get through a lot of scans very quickly, um, the value is obviously going to be immense. And the investment uh, and the return on your investment is going to be immense because you know they they go through a lot, large volume of scans. In in a public hospital uh, setting um, where there's perhaps not as much volume, um, the radiologists tend to have a bit more time to uh, look at the scans. So the return on the investment there is perhaps a little bit less. Um, so it depends on the setting that it's being used for. Um, I think that it's useful. Um, uh, still in the public hospital because it provides another set of eyes for the radiologists and for our trainees and, and potentially also a learning tool for our trainees. Um, so I think that's probably the short answer of it. And just on that, I mean, you know, we hear from every clinical discipline, they're super busy, they're stretched to the max. Is there a role for that? Kind? Can you see the place where AI is going to help trainees and even substitute for some of the direct hands-on consultant supervision time? Or is is that a long way off? Yeah, no, I think I think there's um, you know, a lot of work being done already. Uh, I mean, the, there was discussion last week about trainees using chat GPT to write discharge summaries. Um, and uh, you know, some people uh, do that already, but uh, obviously there's some ethical uh, issues behind that. But I think in terms of training, um, you know, we're we're hoping to use uh, AI and clinical decision support to train um, junior doctors on the appropriate uh, tests, the most appropriate tests for a particular patient. Um, so I think, you know, certainly um, uh, as a training tool, uh, it will be invaluable. The, the other setting that I think, you know, we we run fifty to sixty uh, multidisciplinary meetings at the Alfred uh, a week, um, and this, you know, most of you realize that it's important to have a discussion amongst multidisciplinary teams, nursing staff, um, allied health physicians and allied health uh, people as well as doctors. But it takes a lot of time, you know, you know, to have 10, 20, 30 people in the room having a discussion on the best management for a patient. I think having AI powering this um, will, will not only standardize and reduce variation and reduce variability, um, but also, you know, save a lot of time. Thank you. Thanks, Ming. Um, Anton, I wanted to come back to your um, your idea about patient contribution to the record and patient voice. And can you just talk us through a bit more about, about where that's up to and um, what challenges are you seeing with it or what are patients saying about it? Yeah, sure. Um, one of the big um, issues that patients talk about is that nobody gives them any information about their illness. Um, especially when the patient is a younger person and their carer is the one who looks after them. Our system is such that we don't pay much attention to the carers when the carers are the ones who essentially look after them. And these carers are usually the mothers or the wives. Um, 
I was speaking to uh, a professor of psychiatry uh, in London earlier this year, and I was sharing with her this problem. I was telling her that in India, we don't admit a patient in hospital unless they have a carer. Without a carer, they're not admitted to hospital. And most of the discussion happens between the doctor, the carer, and the patient. Uh, but in Australia, it's um, they give very little importance to the carer, and they focus on the patient. In China, they don't speak to the patient at all. They only speak to the carer. So she reckons that it's a cultural thing. I don't know. But the carers uh, that I speak to in Australia, especially those who are looking after um, you know, patients with severe and enduring mental illness, keep telling us that nobody takes them seriously. Uh, they want to know more about what's going on with their, the, the, their loved one that they're caring for, but nobody cares about telling them anything. Uh, and they want to know more. And even if they say things about the person they're caring with to the, to the clinician, they're not taken seriously. Their, their word is, is, is not as important as that of the patient. Even if the patient has like, for example, florid schizophrenia or something, and says something completely untrue, the clinicians tend to, tend to focus on and tend to uh, take their word more seriously than their mother or their, their wife, who's the one who's you know, really struggling with them day in and day out. So uh, they said, if we have a platform where we can put down our thoughts, our experiences, and it's on record, then um, we can share it with somebody, whether they like to accept it or not. We can say, look, this is what we have been documenting over the last one month with our experience and with the way they have been behaving. If you want to accept it, accept it. If you don't want, go ahead and do what you want. But the time will come when people will be forced to listen to what we have to say. So that's where this whole concept of developing a tool for them to monitor what's going on in their life. So we are in the process of now identifying content. What do they want to, to, to document? What do they want to, how do they want to document? And of course, I'm working with two um, IT specialists from Monash who are um, talking about where including various things like AI and all that, which I have absolutely no idea about. So I leave all that to them. Um, but as long as it looks pretty and it tells the story, that's all I'm interested in. So have you, have you seen or read cases of such a system being used in other places? Because it's, it's a very interesting and challenging thing for the health system yes. as well. No doubt a benefit to the carers and the patients. You know, but the, the other health system is forced to then deal with that in yeah. some way. When they will deal with that, we don't know. But I think, uh, they, you know, they keep saying you've got to be at the right place at the right time. As long as we are in the right place mm -hmm. and we have everything in order, when the right time comes, we'll be at the right place at the right time. Yes. yes, yes. But yeah. what, what, has, what we also know in terms of research evidence is that uh, patients and carers who have more understanding of their own illness and their own trajectory are much better positioned than more empowered to improve and take control of what they can do to improve their conditions. You know, so it's a it, it's a win win in both situations. And and just for some folks in our audience, um, if you're interested in this space, it's a little tangential to what Anton's saying, but in the spirit of patient and care engagement, you can look up about the Open Notes uh, project movement that's uh, heavily based in the Northern Hemisphere, which is all about patients and carers getting better access to, um, to uh, information that the system records about them and increasingly becoming partners in care. And that is happening at scale, but it's a challenge for the healthcare system. Um, there's another one maybe there for you too, Anton, from Ian. Um, just to reiterate a recent anecdote from my point of view as a, as a medical practitioner, my mother was taken to emergency in the last couple of weeks with a fairly significant head injury by ambulance. Um, and I was present at the scene with her. And whilst ma vast majority of things was very well handled by the ambulance service and the hospital in a very busy night, something that disturbed me, which I'm only aware of because I was there as her carer, 
was her being asked, um, uh, having had fentanyl for pain relief and having had a head injury with loss of consciousness, and it turns out a fracture and a subdural, was asked about her desired resuscitation uh, situation. And luckily I was there to hear this and sort of intercede and check later that nothing untoward was recorded in the record. But it just points to the importance of the role of families and, and caring. Um, I'll just um, pause for two seconds. So if there's anyone else in the audience with any more questions to ask, now is the time to do that. Uh, because if no more questions come through in the next minute or two, uh, we will call proceedings to a halt. Um, I'm hoping there's some lovely leads for Chanel and uh, Outcome Health out of this today and some potential new customers thanks, and thanks, sta yeah. stakeholders that he can engage with um, because it really is a great um, asset, the um, yeah. problem. And I'm happy to, you know, if there were questions that I haven't gotten to or if there's something you wanted to chat or just connect, I'm happy to catch up for coffee or a phone call with anyone. So, again, if you missed the QR code, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn or on our website. Um, please, please connect and feel free to reach out. Absolutely. And, and also the reason I paused on my email address at the start, folks, if anyone has any follow-up question. Sometimes the Q&A chat can be a bit hard to get your point across. I'm more than happy to be uh, contacted to refer on to any of our speakers and to help in any other way I can. Um, given I am not seeing any more questions come through uh, and it's almost dinner time, um, what I would like to do, and it's unfortunate we can't do my favourite thing, which is to unmute participants and have everybody give you an audible round of applause. Um, you'll just have to Imagine those rounds of applause coming to you each, um, Meng, Levin, Anton, and Chanel. Thank you all very much uh, for your time. Um, I'm hoping with these sessions that one of the things the audience gets to see too is the really wonderful range of people and skills and expertise and situated settings they all work in that, that are covered across our Adam Alliance. Um, and as uh, we've said, please reach out to me or to the team at Monash or to any of our speakers if you'd like to hear anything more. Uh, so with that, I will thank everyone and um, wish everyone good night.